Given how oh. dangerous first past the post is, again, a system with four parties, three of them to the left of the governing party, what do you see as some realistic way to fix this? Could there be a court challenge? Realistically, in our lifetimes, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> Realistically, to fix the voting system for this country, I think we need to follow what happened in New Zealand. New Zealand is a Commonwealth country just like Canada, where there are enough perverse results for the big parties, which has certainly been happening. Right? So the Liberal Party, for instance, would have had more seats this time under proportional representation. The NDP would have had fewer, but the Conservatives would have had many fewer. Obviously, Greens would have had more. But if we need to get the issue of proportional representation and getting rid of first past the post much better understood across the country so that it can become an election issue, uh, the, my personal effort, it's not just personal, it's the Green Party of Canada, and I'm sorry for making this partisan, I don't like to make anything partisan, this is a nonpartisan meeting, but in terms of the realistic prospects, at least my mandate from the party convention for the Greens and the resolution that was passed there by our members was that I am to pursue electoral cooperation with any party that will work with us to get rid of first past the post. So I'm hoping, I mean realistically it could happen, that I could get the Liberals, the New Democrats to agree that we'd all work together, get rid of first past the post, and form a coalition government after the next election. The difficulty is that so far they don't want to talk to me about it. But you can talk to them about it, and, and we'll just keep pushing. And if people are not familiar with these issues, I recommend you have a look at the website of a group called Fair Vote Canada, because they have a very good, useful, step-by-step -step explanation of what's wrong with First Past the Post, what alternatives there are that other countries use, and I think the more Canadians know about it, please write letters to the editors of newspapers to explain how dysfunctional it is to have a voting system that allowed us to have a majority parliament, a majority of conservatives in the House of Commons, based on 39% support of the 60% of Canadians who voted. So it's a really dysfunctional system. Now, it's going across that. Yes, you're next. Um, I grew up in uh, part of South Africa, where um, uh, surveillance of individuals was you know, very frightening and rampant. And um, with online surveillance, and um, we don't know the extent of it, but recent, uh, well, today, when um, Stephen Harper was talking about, um, with reference to and a member of the United Church of Canada that recently took a stand against um, boycotting uh, certain products from Israel. And uh, his reference directly to that was that um, that was anti-Semitic. So how worried should I be about surveillance and, you know? <coughs> Privacy rights and civil liberties are under assault as never before. Uh, part of it comes with the post 9-11 uh, fears, which are fanned and encouraged by people who don't want to have privacy rights why? and civil liberties. So we're told, why would you worry if someone wants to open your emails? You only have to worry if you've got something to hide. So we need to be, I, I think there are a lot of people, and you know, uh, the, the WikiLeaks and the Snowden and the various things that have, and the fact that Barack Obama has now had to apologize to Angela Merkel for tapping her, hacking into her phone before she was even Chancellor of Germany. Now, none of us here are Angela Merkel, but the, sur the online surveillance and, and the new technologies that make it possible to sort of cluster a whole bunch of emails and, and sift through them for key words of concern, some of this is legitimate security work that we want to have done so that we're safe. But Whoa. civil liberties can't be trampled in the process. So it's, it's really important. I think the fact that um, in the context of pipelines and tankers, as we talked earlier, the fact that CSIS, the RCMP, and the communica Communications Establishment Security Canada, and I'm going to refer to Communications Establishment Security Canada, CSEC, it's a strange outfit, but it spies on foreigners for Canada. It's the outfit that hacked into the government of Brazil Department of Mines computer in what appears to be industrial espionage on behalf of Canadian mining companies. Mm -hmm. So we've got some, so our, our friendships and our allies can be obviously very offended by us. But CSEC and RCMP and CSIS, getting back to where I was, 
uh, have been offering twice a year briefings for Canadian energy companies on activities of threats to pipelines and tanker projects. So Western, energy, Western Canadian energy projects have had these briefings. And I found out about it, many of you probably saw this too, it was published in the British uh, newspaper, The Guardian, including a, a, pro, a, a program for the day that said that this briefing on security threats to pipelines included coffee breaks provided by Enbridge. So you started, you know, at, at this point, what we really need to do is be pushing for much more robust civilian arm's length uh, watchdogs over the surveillance agencies. They cannot also be the consul on the desk of a prime minister who has all the authority. We need to have, we do not have adequate citizen civilian oversight, particularly of the Communications Establishment Security Canada. Uh, and and that because we're not going to stop surveillance, and I think most Canadians wouldn't want us to. They want to have some assurance that, I mean, at, at, at the other end of the spectrum, what's going on at an airport where they give the kid his pipe bomb back and say, go on to the plane. So you've got this kind of disconnect between uh, extensive surveillance, which we're told is about watching out for people who might get a pipe bomb in an airplane, and then, you know, you sort of freeze in your boots if you've got too large a tube of toothpaste. So I don't, I don't, I think the only solution is respect privacy laws, enhance them, respect civil liberties, and ensure that there is robust oversight. Right now in Parliament, we don't have anything like the appropriate level of oversight of the agencies that are empowered to spy on all of us. And I'm not comfortable about it. I'm sure, you know, I, so I, I, I share your concerns, but I think we can do something about it. Now, I've gone this direction, and yes, in the doorway. Yes, thanks, Elizabeth. I wanted to ask you uh, about a local issue, but it's also an environmental issue. It also involves federal regulations and federal funding, and that is the proposed sewage project. Um, before you answer, I'd like to remind you of what Donald Galloway said in the last by-election when he was asked this question. Uh, he said he asked 10 different scientists about it, and they all gave the same answer, that it's not scientifically justified, and it's a low environmental priority. Okay. Well, I, I, you would tell me to address the question. Number one is, uh, I, there is no question that most scientists who've looked at it say in the, in the immediacy of where is that sewage going in terms of being put into a, a very fast-moving channel, is it coming back and causing problems, there are most scientists I've talked to would say exactly what you quote Don Galloway is saying. On the other hand, it is completely, I think, unacceptable for a wealthy industrialized country like Canada to have any uh, sewage dumping into the ocean because, as other reports have said, long term, it's not a sustainable response. So we do need to have sewage treatment, but ideally we should have a sewage treatment process that makes some sense. And I think the current proposal, the idea of pumping biosolids, as they call sewage these days, to a heartland landfill, I mean, it, it runs the risk of converting a non-priority ocean pollution problem to a priority land pollution problem. So we, but we also don't want to lose access to the funds. So the approach I would pursue, if it was in my riding, and if I could, if, if Donald had won, um, would have been to try to get the federal government to, to uh, lease about four acres of excess space that they, that they own around a spinal naval base to put in place a, a treatment system that, was in, that included tertiary treatment that got better control than what they're proposing, that dealt with uh, some of the, uh, you know, we've, done, we've done well by the way, there were, there was a lot more uh, toxic heavy metals that were making their way into our waterways and we've done a lot with, uh, and the CRD has done a good job with reduction at source, such as with mercury amalgams and dentists. Mm -hmm. There's been a number of, and, and car body shops, there's been a number of places where things going down the drain are reducing the amount of toxic loading in our oceans. But we've got, we do have to have sewage treatment for Victoria. I'm, I'm firm on that, but this particular plan, to me, is compromised by the awkwardness of not having a sufficiently large footprint for a plant and the unwillingness to put distributed smaller plants. So you end up with essentially, a, you know, it's like a, a camel being a horse designed by committee. There's something kind of funny about a plan that involves building a pipeline to a, I don't even know that that, that, that plan is going to work. The, the pipeline could 
plug. It, it's not necessarily a good. But it, it, I, I've been, I've seen a number of projects that went wrong because of trying to move things up hills and down and forgetting about the engineering. And sometimes these things will plug and not work very well. It adds to the cost and it reduces the energy capture that you could get. So I, I, I always approach the issue of sewage in Victoria with some trepidation because second only to the Middle East, it, it, it's an impossible topic to discuss with any... <laughs> Mitchell and I would certainly agree with what you just said. Yeah. And there is a local effort to <clears throat> propose a higher level of treatment, a distributed model, just as you, you stated. There is a petition there tonight. Okay. So the petition that you have here tonight, you wouldn't mind if people found you afterwards so they could sign it? Absolutely. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Thank you for being so patient. Hi. Would you like to, I'm going to pass you the mic and I don't have to repeat your question because you're so close. Um, I was wondering if you could please uh, summarize your Lyme uh, disease strategy bill mm -hmm. and why it's so important for Canada and Canadians. And uh, could you please tell us how best to follow in detail when you introduce it in Parliament? I want to watch you live. <laughs> you so please, please do it. Thank you. Well, the Lyme disease strategy bill is Bill 442. It's had first reading, I got it through first reading in June of 2012. How many of you know anybody who's been affected by Lyme disease? Pretty high proportion of the room. How many of you have Lyme disease? Okay. It is, a, it is an epidemic. It, is, uh, it needs a much, uh, well, it needs a national approach. And my bill will go to second reading, I believe, sometime in February. It depends on a calendar that I don't control. I will definitely uh, publicize on the website the minute I know anybody who's on any Green Party lists or ElizabethMayMP.ca uh, has a newsletter, which is not partisan. If you sign up for ElizabethMayMP.ca for a newsletter, I promise you, you'll never hear a single thing about the Green Party, nor will anyone ever write and ask you for money. It is a no-risk information system that's nonpartisan, And I can definitely make sure everybody knows when it goes for a vote for second reading. On my website right now, there are petitions on this bill. What, what the bill does, and I'll run through this very quickly, is it calls for a national Lyme disease strategy based on a consultation it includes the medical establishment, the provincial departments of health, because a lot of this is provincial, Lyme disease <laughs> sufferers, the medical community, and others to come up with three things. Better prevention, you know, so public awareness, what to do to avoid being bitten by a tick, what to do when you think you've been bitten by a tick. <laughs> Two, better treatment, better diagnosis, sharing of best practices between and among the provinces and the medical <coughs> of uh, doctors and others who are researchers who are working on this. And three, search for a cure for those who are, who are you know, we, we, right now the treatments, I don't know how many of you know this, but so many people end up going down to the United States to get massive antibiotic treatments there because they can't get Canadian doctors to provide it here. If you're, if you're diagnosed quickly and correctly and you get that treatment, you're, you're, you can be completely restored to good health. If you're misdiagnosed and you wait a long time, it's it, it can be very debilitating over a very long period of time. So we need to get it passed, and I'm optimistic that we will get it passed. Once it gets to your second reading, it goes to committee for study, could get amended there, comes back from committee, goes to third reading, then it has to go to the Senate. But I'm really hopeful that I can get the bill passed and in law accepted, royal assent, the whole nine yards, before the next election. And you've got a sub subsidiary yeah. question? Do you know what kind of uh, support uh, that you may have from other MPs regarding this bill? And are they, you know, understanding that this is very comparable to the HIV epidemic and that this can actually be passed through blood transfusions, which how Canada is not screening for? It? Yeah. So the question is, what kind of levels of support do I have from other MPs, and how aware are they? And I'm just going to summarize that quickly. I'm really thrilled to tell you that Libby Davies, as health critic for the NDP, says solid NDP support. The Liberals, Kirsty Duncan, says solid liberal support. And from individual conservatives who have spoken with me, I believe I have a majority of conservatives too. 
So the only risk is if it, if it becomes politicized. So I don't want it to be seen as my bill. I don't want it to be seen as a green bill. I would I'd be thrilled if the Minister of Health, Rona Ambrose, took it on and made it a conservative bill. I just want to get it passed. So uh, if the, the petition online, if you have friends and other writings, please get the, the, the petitions have to be, like probably, probably have one back there, but they have to be signed as paper copies. They can't be just signed online on computers to be presented to Parliament. If, they, if you can find MPs who have, you know, if they, that are obviously not me, you don't need to send it to me anymore. Send them, if you can get people who live in a riding with a conservative MP, and they get 24 names on petitions, at 24, make it 30 in case some of the names are wrong, they present them in the House. That's how many you need to present a petition in the House of Commons. And it's a very good way to sensitize the other MPs to the degree of concern in their own writing about the issue. And then, yes. Um, do you want this? No, no, it's not this is a follow-up question. Okay, so the question is, and I'm going to repeat the question, and then I'm going to remind everybody this is a nonpartisan meeting, and if anyone feels uncomfortable with me answering it, just flag it, and I'll t answer it later just to people privately. So the question is that, did she understand correctly that I was saying the only way to, to have Stephen Harper no longer be Prime Minister was through a coalition effort or voter reform, and if it's not voter reform, is there any other way that one could imagine that Stephen Harper wouldn't continue as Prime Minister? So, no. Is there another way of forming a coalition without voter reform? Without voter reform. Okay, so well, that's sort of, sort of a theoretical parliamentary question. But does anyone, I, I'll try to keep it from being partisan. Yes, I mean, Canadian parliamentary democracy, just as in any Westminster parliamentary democracy, uh, allows for coalition governments. Uh, that's what the UK has right now. It, it's got the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, Nick Clegg and Gordon uh, Cam, Cam, Cameron, together Cam, in, in a coalition government. Uh, that's what's normal in other countries. One of the problems, again, is because we're so close to the United States, when there is an election, um, did I say Cameron? Gordon Cameron. Dave Cameron. Okay, thank you. I knew what's wrong with me. Anyway, um, the, the, um, when, when Stephen Harper in 2006 had more seats than anybody else than other parties, but still a minority. That voting result in the UK or in Australia or in New Zealand would have been reported in the newspapers as, we have a hung parliament. Who will form government? But the Canadian media and our Canadian political culture has begun, has aged US politics more and more all the time. So we just say, Harper won. And we go, no, 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 no. And we also focus too much on the leaders. Instead of saying, okay, well, who are the parliamentarians? How is that going to work? What kind of government are we going to have? So we, can, we tend to skip a step when it's a minority parliament. Next time there's a minority parliament, I'm really hopeful that I'll have a caucus of 12 MPs. Right now I've got a caucus of two. You probably heard that. We have a second green MP, so I've got a caucus of two. Well, it's not every day you can double your caucus, so I'm really happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about that, but if, if, assume that Whatever form of, of parties, maybe I'm not even there. Let's not assume that I'm even in the mix. But if you have a minority of a liberal minority, conservative minority, NDP, the way our system works is the leaders of those parties would talk to each other and say, can we work together? Would we put together a coalition? What would it look like? And so it's totally possible. It's actually normal in Westminster parliamentary democracy for that to occur. And the reason it happens so little here, or actually at the federal level, it only happened when um, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, in the initial government of this country, was the great coalition. Uh, since then, we've had a minority parliament, Lester B. Pearson, worked extremely well with the New Democrats. That was a very fertile period for Canadian democracy. That's when we got in uh, the pension plan, we got in uh, health care, a lot of things. We got in a new flag. A lot of things happen in that minority parliament, and we just have to 
you know, understand that and push for it. Now, there, there's, we're pointing to 